Georgia boy to be in California? Think about that. Yeah. At any rate, David has graciously decided that he would come back over here, see his mom, and enlighten us on streaming audio. Now, why are we doing streaming audio? And by the way, we're going to focus on streaming audio this year. We got Ken Forsyth in the, in the audience with MQA, and we'll be having Ken back later on to give us some more information about MQA in a later meeting this year. But we're going to try focusing on meetings where we use streaming audio and we use different equipment so that everybody gets a better idea of what's available. And yes? I don't know if you video. I don't know if you video. Um, is it possible for us to get copies of what one is that done through the club? Is it private or what? No. That's why we're publishing it on the website. The video will be available on the website. What's the website address on the Facebook? Um, oh, Lord. This is really complicated. It's www.atlantaaudioclub.org. One word? All one word. Atlantaaudioclub.org. Just go to Facebook and type AAC or Atlanta Audio Club. It'll, it'll get you right there. David, your, your show, sir. All right, thank you, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the warm welcome. Um, I created some slides because that's what you do. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not, I can't promise that I'm going to follow them very much. I'm here for you guys to kind of answer your questions, cover a lot of things. I've got some material that I want to cover. I want to cover some concepts. I've been to a lot of these talks before, and you know what happens. There's some joker up in the front of the audience that goes into all this long detail of all these theories and math and all the rest of this stuff and cables and bits and bytes and everything else. And all you want to do, you're sitting out in the audience, I'm sitting out in the audience in these things. I just want to learn what do I need to do to get stuff working at home. And like it's all, almost like a telemarketing thing, right? They're going to make you wait until you get to the very end before they tell you like the, the two or three things that you need to know. And that's super annoying. So, um, yeah. so since I've been to a lot of those things, and I find that super annoying, <coughs> I a recorder just All right, yeah, so since I've been to these things, I've been in your seats and your shoes, um, it's really annoying, and I don't want to do that to you. So I was thinking about how to organize this stuff and um, how to put the, together some things that make sense. I appreciate, first of all, everybody here who took some time to fill out the survey. Super great insight that I got from there. Um, you guys are a pretty sophisticated, savvy group as far as this stuff goes. Um, there are a lot of good questions as well, and I'll try to touch on those. I've got some question slides that I checked from here to kind of keep myself honest. If um, we get too close to the end of this thing and you don't feel like your question was answered or you got a new one, you can interrupt me. Uh, I don't mind. If there are too many interruptions, I reserve the right to like make you wait till later. Uh, <laughs> if the questions are really weird, like why am I wearing a black sweatshirt or whatever, then I'm just going to ignore you. But it's great. Besides that, besides that, um, yeah, besides that, we're going to try to cover as much things. So what I want to do at the beginning is explain to you kind of like the bare minimum stuff that you need, so that if you like fall asleep after that, you could still kind of get home and build something that sort of works. And then we're going to go into a lot of detail about. What all this nonsense is over here, this huge cable mess. Um, I promise that at home it doesn't look like that. All this stuff is spread out much further apart. That's kind of the point of networking is to spread things apart. But for the, for the purposes of this room, we kind of had to stick everything together. So, yay. All right. So, simplest possible thing. Um, these are essentials. I'm going to go back and explain what streaming is, and we're going to define all that stuff. So just pretend like I've already done all this stuff, and you just want to know the bare minimum so that you can get things done. So there are a few pieces you need to be able to do streaming in your house. Um, some of you have probably already done it before. If you've got a phone that's connected up to the internet and you can plug headphones into it and listen to music, either local files, uh, well, let's more local files for a minute. You can listen on Spotify or YouTube or uh, Tidal or Koboos or whatever. If you're doing that on your phone, you're technically doing streaming. You've got all the little bits that you need kind of in one little piece. Um, but if you're an audio file, you may not be satisfied with the sound of that. I hope you're not, because um, you can do a lot better than that. If you thought, like, gosh, my turntable sounds so much better than my cell phone, well, you're probably right, or at least I'll right. <laughs> If your turntable doesn't sound better than your cell phone, then we've got a lot of work to do here. <laughs> so, um, so yes, you can do streaming with almost anything these days. Everybody's doing it. All the kids are doing it. Nobody, like, a lot of the kids, they don't buy physical media anymore. They just listen on their phones, or they listen on their, if they have a laptop or their Xbox or whatever else. 
Um, they're all doing this stuff. Um, but it's, it's typically not very good, which is why kind of our us audio file guys have kind of stuck in the corner. We're off to the side of this whole thing. We've been letting this stuff roll by. And John said, well, why are we doing this all of a sudden in 2020? The reason we're doing this in 2020, and I'll get into this a little bit more, is because it's gotten a lot better. It's gotten to the point where it's good enough that, that most of us, if we take some time to set things up properly, can get sound that's on par with some of the analog sources that we've had in the past. Um, one of the things that, that, that's kind of a lie about this stuff is that, you know, with digital, it's either, either it works or it doesn't. The sound quality is always the same. Everything's perfect. You know, with a turntable, I mean, Mark Trimmer will come out and explain for hours and hours how you've got to set up everything just right. Um, there's a turntable setup is like a, you can get PhD level classes and anything. But on the digital side, people are like, yeah, you just connect this and you connect this and then it works and that's about as good as it can ever get. And so a lot of us are just not very satisfied with the digital experience because it doesn't sound very good. But I mean, in a lot of cases, right? Some of you've got very good sounding digital systems. It takes about as much effort, and there are about as many ways the digital can go wrong as analog. And so you only get out of stuff what you put into it, right? So it takes some effort to kind of <coughs> get up to that level and to be satisfactory. Yes, John? David, do we have some handouts that you're going to give me to publish on the website after this? Yeah, I'll give you the slide deck, and I'm going to put like about 100 references at the end of it. I haven't put those Great. on yet, which is why I haven't published this. Plus, like we talked about before, you hand these guys out handouts, they're flipping through things, and pretty soon, right, exactly. what, you know, they don't know what I'm talking That's about. That's why I said we'll publish it later. Yeah, so pay we'll, attention, guys. You guys can pay attention, but don't feel like you have to write everything down, because you'll have some of this stuff. If it helps to write things down, so if you remember, feel free to, but I'm not going to be offended, but I'm not going to give you a handout. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, handout. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I mean, I'm from California. That's what we do, it's handouts, but I'm not <laughs> I'm from Georgia, so we're not really going to do that, right? No, so, uh, discourse, man. Yeah, sorry about that. So, <laughs> tone down the rhetoric. So anyway, there's a, there's a few pieces that you need. If you look and you squint your eyes at this diagram, you're going to see four things, right? There's this network thing in the middle, um, and that's pretty important and oftentimes forgotten about. And then there's this music server, which some architectures need and don't. But for our purposes, since we're audio files, we're going to want to have a music server someplace to keep up with things. If you guys have JRiver or some of the other things that you've been using, you're familiar with this concept of a piece of software that runs on a computer that indexes your library and keeps up with all the metadata and lets you choose, you know, to have playback controls and decide where the playback's going to go and that kind of stuff. So that's a component that's going to be common to all streaming. So these are these are computer audio concepts that if you're if you've been doing computer audio at all, you're pretty familiar with, right? So would you consider JRiver a music server? Oh yeah, it's a music server. We'll right. talk about some of the differences in the architectures. You, you normally want a remote control, right? So I've seen some of you guys, I know Chuck used to do this, they'll have like a, a a five meter USB cable that goes across the room and then kind of a laptop close to where he's sitting so that he can control things. Um, and you can do that, but like, you know, cable length even kind of matters in the digital world a little bit. And it's just, I don't know, maybe even convenient for you to have a, a laptop. It's not really a great listening experience but you can have a laptop so close to you. So a lot of people are using their smartphones or a tablet um, or something else to kind of, so that you don't have to feel like you have a giant laptop on your laptop. You can, you can control playback just with a smartphone or a tablet. It's a little more convenient. J Remember has a great remote control app that I know a lot of you guys are using called J Remote. It's still pretty impressive. I think it was around seven or eight bucks or something like that. So not free, but you know, it does a good job of uh, talking to wherever you've got your computer. And it doesn't require you to have your computer sitting next to you anymore. A remote control is pretty nice. The better music service will let you have more than one remote control that you can run at the same time and they stay synchronized. So if I you know, choose an album, then somebody else looks at that album's cover up will be showing on their remote control. So if you have two or three people in your listening room, not everybody, you don't have to pass the remote control around. Like everybody can just use their own smartphone if they're on the same Wi-Fi network. So remote control is a pretty nice thing. Just for, It's not required, but it's pretty nice. Now, again, if you're doing everything on your phone, like your phone is the music server, your phone is the remote control because it's a local control, and your phone is the output device. But it, for audio files, we're going to want to try to separate those to improve both the quality of the listening experience and the, how, how enjoyable that listening experience is. And then you need an output device. So somehow you've got to connect all this stuff to your stereo. Um, and this is a part that maybe some of you think you have, but I'm going to tell you why you don't actually have what you think you have. Um, um, generally speaking, we want this output device to be very, very low noise. So we want no fans. We want um, very, very low power. Uh, we want low EMI and RFI. You can't hear. EMI and RFI, if you can, it would probably explode you. Um, so we want very, very low noise because uh, it's analog circuitry, right? And it's very delicate. We don't want that noise getting in there and kind of messing up the sound. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about why noise is an important thing, but on, on the digital side, noise has a weird impact to digital that's different from analog. 
And so um, it's not, it's, 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 it's more important with digital circuitry to keep noise out uh, even than analog. So, well, we want to have some, we've got to have some kind of thing that gets music in from the network and outputs it in analog form to our system because we, we can't hear digitally yet. Maybe there'll be an implant that we can put in our brain at some point okay. so you can just hear digital directly. But for now, we've got to, um, we've got to have a driver that creates some sound pressure waves that, that our ears respond to and then our brain as it turns out, digitally samples and, and, and uh, plays it back to us so we can understand it. So three, those are the three, the four components. Network is really, really important. Um, I talked about that a little bit before, and we'll touch on that some more. Um, all right. Usually the way we do this kind of stuff is you need a music server um, and an output device, and we like those to be connected via wired, wired Ethernet if we can. Wi-Fi wi has gotten to be more than fast enough for streaming digital audio. So, I mean, if you can watch 4K video over Wi-Fi, probably, Audio is not that big of a problem, right? But um, there are other reasons why having a wired connection is just a little bit nicer, and we'll talk, to, talk about that a little bit more. But it's, it ends up being, if you use a wired connection, you end up just having fewer problems than you would tend to have with Wi-Fi. And so it's, even though it's 2020, um, and Wi-Fi is more than fast enough for this stuff, I mean, we're getting close to, with Wi-Fi 6, we're getting close to gigabit speeds over Wi-Fi. It's massive, massive overkill for audio, but um, it's, it's nicer to have a wired connection. The other problem with Wi-Fi is that you do have a radio transmitter like and receiver right next to your audio equipment that you kind of rather not have if you can avoid it. So the wired kind of the wired has its own problems, but it avoids that. Now with a remote control, you don't a wired connection to a remote control is irritating, right? You don't want a cable coming out of your phone and tethered to the wall or whatever. So your remote control device you're going to want to have on Wi-Fi. So in your home network, you need a wired you need both wired infrastructure and Wi-Fi. Um, how many folks feel like they have that today? They're in pretty good shape there. It's probably about half or so. It's pretty good. Um, one of the things I'll talk about, um, I've, I've talked to audiophiles, I know John is one of the folks who've done this, who will pay to have um, dedicated power lines run to their audio equipment so that, you know, that their audio equipment has a dedicated circuit that's not kind of, you know, daisy chain shared, but shared with all the rest of the circuitry in the house. Maybe it costs a few hundred bucks to have an electrician go and do that. But they balk at the idea of having a low voltage guy come in and run an ethernet cable to their audio system. But I would encourage you, if you haven't, don't have something like that, to do that. It's on the same order of importance as far as sound quality goes uh, to be able to have a wired connection in your listening room if you don't already. When I sent out the survey, most people said that they had a network connection in the listening room. I'm not sure what percentage of those were wired in Wi-Fi. I kind of didn't ask, so. Yeah, um, wired is Wi-Fi. All right, so uh, what do you really need? So you just need any reasonably modern PC or Mac to kind of get started with this stuff. So if your computer was made in the last five years, it's probably pretty okay. Uh, Windows 10. And, and current or Mac OS, I forget what Mac OS versions are, but 10.1 something and higher is just going to be okay for um, running this. The reason you need a reasonably powerful PC is because you may be playing to more than one output. You may be responding to more than one remote control device in your house, and you want you don't want the PC to kind of fall behind on all that stuff. So you want it to be fast enough to keep up. Digital is, um, I said that it's not true that it's either works or it doesn't, but it definitely fails spectacularly if the computer can't keep up with, uh, with the speed. And so any reasonably modern PC will work. And you probably already have those. I, I know when I sent the survey out, most people said, yeah, I've got a computer someplace in the house. Some people said they didn't have a computer that fit either of the two descriptions. It might be time to go pick one up. The good news is that computers that are fast enough for doing this stuff are super cheap, like on the order of a couple hundred bucks or so. So you don't have to go out like John did and build some monster gaming machine for audio <laughs> if you don't want to. Um, you know, you can you can buy something kind of off the shelf already with the Windows 10 operating system if you're comfortable with that. On the Mac world, I'm less familiar and it probably costs a bit more because it's fancy. Yeah. But I mean, you don't have to spend a thousand, two thousand dollars anymore to, to have a computer that's fast enough to do this kind of stuff. A couple hundred dollars usually is all you need. But you may already have this piece sitting in your house that you can just use if you just didn't think about using it this way. Um, most people here, I think, have a smartphone or a tablet. Half of, half of us probably couldn't find this place without a smartphone that, you know, doing the maps or whatever, right? So, so I mean, that, I'm going to assume that that's probably a given. So the only piece that you might be missing, oh, and you need a decent network. We talked about that. Consider having a, a wired connection run to your house if for some reason you don't have a wired connection run to your listening room. Consider doing that. Most of us, uh, maybe the part that's missing is either a streaming DAC or a network audio transport. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but remember in the olden days, um, I know that, um, uh, Sam and Ed had in their shop, they had a lot of Theta DACs uh, and, and, and Theta transports. So it became popular kind of in the early 90s to separate the CD player into two pieces where you had this outboard DAC with an SPDIF cable and then a, a CD transport instead. 
this, the digital equivalent of that is pretty much the same thing. So instead of, um, instead of a CD transport, we have a network transport. But it can connect up to your DAC the same way. If you still have a DAC from the 90s, chances are you can bring it into the you know, 21st century just by adding a device that will give you network connectivity to, to that DAC. So uh, don't fear. You don't, I'm not going to tell you that you have to go and replace a DAC if you've got one that you really like. You just need to be able to get network information uh, to it. Um, so I kind of marked off the things that you probably have and what you're missing. How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Um, so here's some examples. Uh, maybe you have a, a, a desktop PC that's running Windows 10 that's sitting in your office. It's probably connected maybe over a wire ethernet directly to your router so that you can get out to the internet. Um, that, that computer may not be in your listing room. It probably shouldn't be in your listing room. We'll explain why later. Uh, but it's connected to your net home network. It's, 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 it's a, it's, it could be a powerful PC with a lot of fans. It can make a lot of noise. It's in your office where hopefully you're not, that's not your primary listening environment. And um, it'll work just fine. So if you've already got something like that, you're in good shape. If you don't, I mean, a laptop can work as well. Laptops are nice because they have built-in um, UPS. <laughs> if the electricity is off, the laptop stays on because it has a battery in it usually. Um, and uh, they usually can be connected up over a wired network. Some of them can't, but some of them, uh, they can be connected over a wired network. But any kind of computer in your house that's, like I said, reasonably modern and on your network, but ideally not in or near your listing room can work fine for this kind of application. Um, and then, if you have, in my example here, you've got an Android smartphone. There's a bunch of apps on Androids uh, that can uh, talk to a music server uh, and play music. And then in this example, um, I've cited uh, my Tech Brooklyn Bridge Streamer. It's about a $3,000 device, but it's, um, it's kind of like an all-in-one type of deal, right? So it's an analog preamp. It's got analog RCA inputs. It's got a uh, phono stage in it, mm -hmm. so you can connect a turntable to it. Um, it will connect up to your network over wired or Wi-Fi network, mm -hmm. and it has a really nice DAC in it. The DAC does DSD and MQA and kind of all the stuff that you could ever imagine. So um, while it sounds like a lot, by the time you add up all the prices of all those individual components, if you separated them out, um, you'd have to spend a lot of money. So this is one solution. If you've got these two pieces, just go out and buy a $3,000 DAC streamer mm -hmm. thing, and you'll be in good shape. Um, We'll talk about some lower cost ways to do this. I'm just giving you kind of some random examples that I know work really well. Um, maybe you're a Mac person. Any Mac people in here? A couple or three? Where's Lee? He's <laughs> not here. Yeah. Lee's not here. All right, so we don't have a main Mac person as far as I'm concerned, but I'm sure all of you guys are excellent Mac people. So any Mac that's running Mac 10 dot something high uh, is going to work fine for this kind of application. There are a number of different kind of music servers that run on the Mac ecosystem of the work. Um, you'll probably have a, if you're a Mac person, you probably have all Apple anything, Apple socks and Apple underwear and <laughs> Apple phone and <laughs> Apple car. Um, so you'll probably have an iOS smartphone. And again, any more reasonably modern one will work really well. They, they're actually very pretty. So um, <coughs> I can uh, make a very nice remote control. And then in this example, I said, well, maybe you, because you're an Apple, you, have, you make more money than the rest of us. So you probably have a PS Audio Direct Stream DAC with Network. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of another example. And then, like, you've got a complete music, you've got all the pieces that you need, right, to build this thing. Well, I haven't mentioned the network, but I'm assuming that the network and electricity are kind of a utility thing at this point. Um, and if you don't have those, that you'll take care of them so you can build this stuff out. Um, or maybe you have a PC, either PC, Windows, or Mac. Um, you've got a smartphone or tablet that you don't mind using as a remote control. And you can have like many of those like throughout your house so that the family can get involved. Um, and you've got a um, USB or SB diff DAC that you like. Um, John's got one that he brought in here that's a pretty nice little $400 unit. Or you've got something that's, that you already own. You don't need to buy another one. Or in some cases, people will have like Oppo Blu-ray players that will take um, uh, a USB connection in, right, so that they can act like a DAC. Um, some people have integrated amplifiers with USB input in the back or an SP input in the back, and so that can act like a DAC. It's like there's a DAC in just about every appliance in your house, it seems like. Um, so if you look around, you probably have more than one of these out things that could be used like an outboard DAC, and you haven't considered it. So if you connect um, this company, an uh, Indian telecommunications company called Hello, um, and they make all these telecom boards, and what one of the guys who works at the company discovered is that telecommunications involves a lot of digital analog and analog to digital circuitry. Um, a lot of audio circuitry and that stuff. So why not like build a sub, a sub part of that company that just does audio boards and audio related stuff? So they, being in India, the prices for these things are a little more affordable. So there's this network bridge thing. Um, it's an Allo US bridge. And I brought one here that you can kind of take a look at later on. Um, and it takes network in, audio in over the network. 
and then it'll send it out either over SPDIF or over USB, kind of depending on which DAC uh, you have, what DACs work better. Some DACs may support both USB and SPDIF, and, but they work way better over SPDIF than USB um, and that kind of thing. So you, you said that was a network bridge? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm going to call that a network audio transport, and yeah, so I can be consistent with the terminology, right? So, so just in linking this example to your earlier diagram, those mm -hmm. items are the transports. That yeah, you exactly, have. exactly. Um, you know, and if you combine this bullet point here, we've got sort of a transport and DAC put together. So a streamer mm -hmm. is is like a CD player, right? So it does the networking pieces and it does the digital analog conversion. So in your mind, if you think CD player. Think streamer. Those are the, those are kind of equivalent concepts in the sort of old world and the new world as far as these things go. And then this network audio transfer transport and DAC. That's like your CD transport and DAC. It's the same kind of concept. The DAC is the DAC, but you have an outboard device that's feeding it a digital signal. It's just getting that signal over the network instead of reading it using a laser off of a off of a physical disc. So, so you can have those as individual pieces, or you can have them. Combined into one box. Yep, exactly, exactly. You know, audio files, we like to break everything apart. We can get <laughs> mono blocks. Oh, wait, now, now we need active crossover so we can have a separate mono block amplifier for each tweet or mid range. Oh, we can separate that. In. We'd like to separate things out into molecular level types of things. And um, our vendors are, no, are, are very pleased when we do that kind of stuff. <laughs> sell more boxes. Um, anyway, so this is how you kind of decompose those things. Um, or if you want to, if you, let's suppose you want to dip a toe into this stuff and you're not quite prepared to spend. This Isla thing runs for kind of between $250 and $600, depending on how many optional extra things you bolt onto it. Um, you can start off super cheap, right? So you've got a Mac or PC that's free because you already paid for it. You've got a smartphone or tablet that you've already paid for. You've got a home network that you've already paid for. So the only thing, that, and you've got a DAC that you like that you've already paid for. So you just want to put that back on the network so that you can start streaming to it. If you just buy a Raspberry Pi or this NanoPi thing, and I'll show you some pictures of those later. These are little tall, small board computers. They're super low noise, super low power, um, and uh, they're super cheap, right? Like on the order of 50 bucks all in. Um, but you can just connect up to one of your DACs to get it on the network so you can try out the streaming and see if it even works for you. It's a little bit more of a DIY solution. Um, but there are some YouTube videos made by me and other people that kind of go over how to set it up. and. If you're even the least bit computer savvy, you can sort of knuckle your way through that. And I know a lot of people here are kind of DIY oriented, so that might be a fun approach. Yes. So the, the Raspberry Pi then would function as a network transport? Yep, exactly. Cool. The Raspberry Pi is a bit limited by, by default because it's it only has USB ports, so it doesn't do the SP diff thing, but you can buy these what they call hats. There's little boards that snap on top of the Raspberry Pi um, without any soldering that can give you an SP diff output. And those vary in quality from horrible to kind of okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's enough, you can get started with it, right? And, and, it, and it'll probably sound better than a lot of other options. You'll, you'll probably hear about other people who will talk to you about, you can use some of the Logitech Squeezebox stuff to do some of these things. You've done that stuff before, I know. That's kind of compatible with it conceptually with this stuff. Some of the Chromecast and Chromecast Audio stuff that you get by anymore um, can work and fill in. There's some protocol limitations to all these different things, but they're all options for getting the streaming stuff into your system without, and this is important, without having a computer in your listening room to kind of mess up the sound. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Are you gonna mention the Rune Nucleus at some time? I am, I am. Uh, I don't know why I didn't think about putting that on here, but the Rune Nucleus, it's a good question. So Rune, if you're familiar with Rune Labs, they make um, arguably the best streaming services available, or the best streaming media server available. Um, they come from kind of Sulu's heritage, um, so the Sulu system was like a 13 grand monstrosity thing, and then all those guys got bored of implementing that and kind of made their own company, <laughs> so that you can uh, you can get some of that functionality and maybe actually even better functionality now for quite a lot less. Um, so they make a kind of dedicated PC um, or a computer that's dedicated to being a music server. It's a bit more expensive, but the nice thing is we'll talk about this a lot more later. But since you since you asked, the nice thing about it is you buy this thing. Like so let's suppose you're not computer savvy. You don't want to figure out Linux or install server things or deal with Windows updates. You just want something that you give it power, you give it networking, you put it someplace in your house and it just works. And that's what kind of this Nucleus thing does for you. So um, as far as updates and like server administration, if you will, all this stuff's handled remotely, remotely by the guys at Rune Labs. So you don't have to be an administrator. You just have to provide electricity and networking to the thing and it just works. Um, it's more expensive because of that, but um, you're, you're kind of offloading all that expertise to other people who are going to know how to do it and 
And for a lot of people, that's especially if you work, even if you work in computers like I do, you come home, you want to just sit down in your chair, press a button, and listen to music. You don't want to be like, oh, hang on a second, I've got to install this update. Oh, wait, you know, this thing's not working anymore. I need to restart this device over here. Or that's, that's, that just takes all the joy out of audio, and then you just want to go and do something else. So, um, so there's a compelling argument for that kind of device in spite of its cost. That's uh, so a good question. Anything else? I'm going to move forward. I'm going to run on time. Uh, I think, yes, it is time for our music break. I did pretty well, actually, I think. Yeah? Impressed with myself. All right, so these are some questions uh, that, that some folks asked. Uh, if you ask this question, don't raise your hand unless I fail to answer it properly. Um, somebody asked, how do artists get compensated when music is rented rather than owned? Right? This whole streaming idea is you're renting the music. You don't actually own the album anymore. Um, so do the musicians actually still get paid? I don't have this data. You can look it up yourself. It's pretty um, unimpressive. Um, I think that, uh, I think, think that uh, ironically, Napster is the streaming company that pays musicians the most. And they were kind of initially responsible for the whole demise of the music system, or somebody, some people would argue that, right? So they pay people about twice as much as Tidal. Tidal's kind of the next company down as far as how much they pay the musicians. And then it all goes pretty sharply down from there, with Spotify and YouTube being pretty much the worst. Uh, so, you know, but it's all very small, right? So somebody, I can't remember, it's something ridiculous, like somebody's album has to be streamed 300 times for them to make a dollar or something crazy like that, right? So if you want, if you have musicians that you like and you support and that are still alive, um, like go to their concerts, buy their merch, buy their albums, buy their CDs, get them to sign things. Don't, don't like come on paying, keeping the music, the music industry alive by your streaming subscription. It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> Didn't Justin Timberlake just request that all of his people put his uh, new uh, album on repeat. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that could be, I mean, you could try that, I guess. And especially if you're, so, so he can fly around the world a little more. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think he'd have, he may have enough fans. I don't know. He's pretty popular. He may have yeah, enough fans that, that that'll actually generate some income. But it's, yeah, it's pretty. As far as streaming income goes, it's pretty abysmal. If you're thinking about starting a band and just being streaming only. Um, you, hopefully, I hope you're independently wealthy because that's going to be tough. <laughs> uh, digital sharing and legal ramifications. So, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not going to give you uh, legal advice on this stuff. Um, my philosophy on this stuff is to treat music like a book, right? So, if um, if I lend you a CD, then I can't play that CD anymore. If I lend you a digital file, then I'm not going to play that file until you, you delete it and you've verified that it is. It's a kind of a gray area. We're not really supposed to have digital files anyway, except for stuff that you buy from HD tracks. Um, well, CD, CD ripping is technically not legal, but in the US anyway, the IRA just kind of looks the other way as long as it's for personal use. But as soon as you start doing weird things like ripping all your CDs and then selling them all, then you're, you've, you've crossed a, at least an ethical line and potentially a legal line as well that I'm not gonna advise you what to do or not, but kind of just put yourself in kind of the copywriter or the musician's perspective, like, is, is what you're doing, and if everybody did the same thing that you're doing, would that support them or not, and you'll be able to kind of use your conscience as a guide for that. I, I think the reason why they're, they're not doing that is, if you remember back to use, use of cassettes mm -hmm. to record, there was a ruling by the court called fair use, yeah. which meant if you buy it, you have the right to move it into another, uh, another form. platform, mm -hmm. As long yeah. as you don't share it or don't sell it, right, right. And I think they they try not to get into that with CDs for the same reason. Yeah. yeah. They know that the court will rule against them, so they just said, "Well, look the other way." The other thing that's kind of annoying is like if you spend forty bucks on this really awesome high resolution album on HD tracks, there was a legal case in New York a few years ago that said you can't like when you're done listening to that, you can't sell that those that digital file to somebody else. You do not have the right to sell that file, only HD tracks does. So that's like, if you've got, if you look at your album collection, you say, well, gosh, I've, I've bought a thousand albums from HD tracks, so my music collection ought to be worth, you know, mm -hmm. 10 grand or so. Yeah, it's not worth anything. It's not, <laughs> it's only worth at most the media that it's sitting on. And so don't get too attached to those digital files. And that's really, I think, as people start to realize these things, they're like, wait a second, maybe I should just stream these things rather than buying them. Because like, the, the investment is just, throwing money kind of away uh, versus, versus buying. So, but what you just heard was uh, streaming from Tidal. Um, I don't think this was an MQA thing. I think it was just kind of a standard dress thing. 
I found it because I'm in a bunch of audio groups on Facebook and somebody said, hey, check this out, it's kind of cool. Uh, it's not an album that I would have bought, <laughs> but it sounds hella cool. It's really, like, it's very, very interesting, right? So, it's, yeah, bad John. Yeah, but the point is, in the old days, you'd have to buy the album right, to right. have it. Now, you can borrow it when you need to. I can borrow it, I can play it for friends and say, this is like weird yeah. stuff. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, and the artist just made his three thousandths of the same. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I, I sincerely <laughs> hope so. I sincerely hope so. Happened to a nicer guy. David, you got some more questions out here. All right, fire away. Uh, taking this tune as an example, imagine that you had no idea it was out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but some particular afternoon, you were in a really unusual mood, and you said to yourself. Emotionally, musically, I want to listen to something like this. Yeah. Uh, how do you get an overview of the streaming music sources that are available? And once you know what they are, how do you search their inventory to find this very thing? That's a very good question. I think for me, music discovery is a lot like it was in the other days. A lot of the a lot of the things that I get to listen to, I, I find out from other people who told me that I should check them out. The nice thing is that I can check them out immediately instead of having to, like John said, go down to a record store and put on headphones that some people with greasy hair wore before me and deal with all that stuff. Um, I can just listen to it on my own system. Um, the nice thing about uh, this, this, the service that I'm using right now, title connected to Rune, is that if I thought this song was interesting for whatever perverse reason, um, there's a kind of crowdsourced uh, machine learning database that will give me a whole bunch of other artists and albums that are going to be kind of similar to that. And so I can explore that rabbit hole as deeply as I want to based on that engine. Now that's the service that's on top of Tidal, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So it's taking Tidal's library, somebody else's database and intelligence, combining those two so that I can get very kind of targeted recommendations uh, for what I want based on some random bit that I found that's listed. So you find a thread, you can explore down the length of that thread once you have those two things together. John? Yeah, as, as a member.